Okay, we're ready. Um, hi, welcome back to the Hortman Show. We're inside today. I know that seems unusual after the last couple episodes, but it's darn hot and dry out there, as many of you have seen. Um, lawns are starting to look crispy, and we'll talk about those in a, a little bit later because we're moving into the season where a lot of people are having issues with um, with uh, grub damage and we may not get grub damage this year so we'll talk about that later but actually our first specimen or bug of the day is kind of cool it's a um a katydid and a katydid is the big green bug that blends into a lot of leaves and this this one will crawl out slowly probably it's getting blown around a little bit by the um by our, I guess, air conditioning, but katydids are cool because of the sound they make. They make a very distinctive chirp. And for people who um, really, <laughs> wow, you really got blown around there. Let's knock you out here on this lid and let you crawl around. Katydids make a, a chirp at night um, that's very distinct and high pitched. And a lot of people hear that and associate it with the end of the summer, kind of like the locust during the day or crickets in the fall. Um, a katydid did chirp is interesting. Like many insects, the chirp will correspond to the temperature. And actually, it's really cool. You can calculate the temperature it is, the ambient temperature outside. How's that for nerdy? Uh, but katydids really aren't um, a problem pest. I think they're just interesting. Um, as we get to the end of the summer, you start to see lots of big bugs, uh, big spiders, big beetles, big moths. Um, they're all out there. Uh, most of them aren't a problem. Probably the biggest problem that I've gotten calls on recently are yellow jackets. And yellow jackets have reached extremely large populations um, in, in, the, in uh, the landscape and their nests are large and they're getting to the point where a lot of the, the, the workers are starting to abandon the nests or maybe being forced out and they're crashing parties or ending up in picnics um, and probably the best thing is to be on guard for those. If you find a yellow jacket nest and it's a problem, it's in a location where you're worried about people being stung, you can treat the nest there's all sorts of insecticides out there, but I would say don't try to do a big global treatment where you spray the entire yard hoping to kill yellow jackets. It's best to treat the area. And for people who are sensitive or very wary of being bitten or stung, you would probably want to hire a professional to do it. Um, if you need any more information on it, please feel free to give me a call or email. My email is hortman at umd.edu. Um, so enough of the Katie dids. This one actually surprised me and stayed in the container. Well, I'll let it go back outside at my house. Um, another interesting thing that came across uh, my desk, actually somebody gave me a call, so I swung by and looked at their bush, um, was they said, hey, I got these evergreens that are dying. And sure enough, when I stopped by, they had some blue spruce that were dead. But a small bush, a mugo pine, had a lot of these brown tips. And as you can see by the pictures that we have on the screen, half the bush, at least the front half of the bush, is dead. And this bush is being affected by a, a fungal disease called Diplodia. And it is problematic in Austrian pine, Scotch pine, and also these Mugo pines. At this point in the game, or this point in the year, it's too late really to do anything other than prune out the dead material. Um, this, the dead stuff is going to be easy to identify because it's brown needles. Um, and Diplodia, tends to have a, a dusty appearance. And if you look with a magnifying glass at the, um, the, the needles especially, you'll see a lot of black specks. Um, you're, if you really want to save the plant and not replant after you've pruned out everything, come back then in the spring and there's a regimen on fungicides that you can spray, but you typically have to spray multiple times. Um, I argue that maybe it's better to plant a bush that is, isn't as susceptible and mugo pines that are planted in areas where there's lots of moisture um, in the spring and then dry droughty periods during the summer are very prone to this problem and boy this summer it was perfect for it because we had a very moist long spring that extended in the summer and now it's nice and dry and toasty. 
So I suspect we'll see a lot of mugo pines affected by this diplodia tip light. Um, another, I guess, sad disease in the landscape, and I have better pictures that I'll share with you um, on the screen, are that of um, bacterial leaf scorch. It's actually a bacterial agent that affects primarily oaks, um, and, and, and really in our area it seems to only affect red oaks, or at least um, species in the red oak family. It's hard to see from my samples here I have in the studio, but the picture um, it shows it better, is between the um, brown edge of the leaves, and that's what we're looking at. Actually here you can see there's a brown edge around the entirety of the leaf, and then toward the, the leaf petiole or stem, it's still a green region, which is considered healthy. And between those two regions, typically, when it's a little moister, you'll see a yellow band, and that's the horizon of the bacteria within the leaf. And again, the image on the screen here that I, I shot about two weeks ago of a red oak, of the, actually the very same red oak leaf, you can see that very distinct yellow band. Um, people worry about this disease. There's not a lot you can do. You could hire an arborist company and they can inject the tree with an antibiotic and that will keep the disease at bay. Um, but the thought is that it really doesn't cure the tree from the disease, that it just suppresses it, suppresses the symptoms and keeps the tree relatively healthy. Um, the thought also is that this disease is spread from tree to tree by leaf hoppers, which are a small sucking insect that can hop or be carried in the wind from one tree to the other. Um, fortunately, I haven't seen many of these uh, red oaks uh, with the problems, but it's something to be aware of. Um, usually the symptoms show up um, the beginning of August and express themselves through uh, October. So we'll have to wait and see what happens with these. The one tree that I plucked these off of um, has slowly been losing branches um, for the last probably five or six years. To really diagnose this, you need to have this sent to a lab, and many arborist um, companies can send this off just to confirm it. But that telltale pattern of green leaf um, center with the brown edge and that yellow band is pretty indicative of the, of the disease. Um, the other thing is I've been getting plenty of snakes in my office. I wish people wouldn't bring them in. Um, this one's dead. Uh, snakes are a protected species in, in Maryland. Um, a lot of them tend to end up, I've noticed over the years, in houses when it dries out. And I've talked with pest control companies and they've said the same thing. They get lots of calls about snakes inside. The thought is that they're, the snake's food source is being driven inside both um, mice primarily and maybe even some insects. And the snakes are, are carnivores and tend to pursue these things. And this was a black snake that really probably could have been ushered outside. Um, check for cracks and crevices. A great hint that one pest control company told me is check around the, um, the outtake for the condenser for an air conditioner and that um, will many times be the source or the attraction for the snake. The moisture's there, so mice and whatever will come and try and feed in that area and then make it inside. So you can seal that area off a little um, uh, uh, more completely. Um, finally, getting back to the drought, um, don't have any samples, but if you look outside, lots of lawns are turning brown and have been brown. This is natural. Part of this is natural. This is the dormancy bit that, um, that fescues that the turf grasses go through. And that will kind of help preserve the plant by letting the top turn brown and the, and the crown and the root system will remain alive and kind of wait it out. They'll go into a dormancy and wait for the rains to start up. At this point, don't try to do a whole lot with your lawn. You want the moisture levels to come up before you start fertilizing or at least treating for weeds. If you fertilize and you try to use many of the weed control products when it's dry, you're going to actually probably um, do more damage to the lawn. So hold off and wait for the weather to catch up and then try doing your fertilization. Um, I suspect um, there's going to be some grub damage that shows up because Japanese beetle populations were higher this year. Um, however, we do know from history that uh, Japanese beetle populations crash especially when we have dry end of July and August periods. So 
I have to wait it out and see what really happens to the population below ground. My suspicion is in very dry areas, um, a lot of the young Japanese beetle grubs that hatched out will die, but in marginal areas that did get uh, precipitation or adequate moisture, we're going to see damage to the turf and big populations of Japanese beetles next year. Um, if you have questions, feel free to give me a call at the Carroll County Extension Office. My number is 410-386-2760, or you can get me at the email address um, below. Also, follow us on, on um, YouTube or like us on social media. Thank you. Okay, guys, got through that in record time, I think. I don't know. God, I love the feedback. When are we going to have call-ins or visitors bringing in wrangling a planet? <laughs>